from like kind of this morose, like distorted guitar rock. Um, there's one song on there called uh, This Is Heaven I Die For. It's like one of my favorite songs of the year. It sounds like somebody took all the, 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 the feedback kind of shreddy guitar singles in the 90s <laughs> and just slowed them way down. Oh, yeah? So it's, 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 it's almost like an aggressive version of slowcore to me. Huh. Which I really, really loved. And uh, also because the, the vocals are also very kind of like, kind of flat and stone and kind of sad. But the, but the music like jumps all over the place. Like there's like these, um, there's like hip hop tracks. There's one song that takes um, a Frank Ocean song and like really like um, kind of auto tunes. One of the, like it kind of chipmunks the vocals a little bit. <laughs> it's a sample and it just sounds, it's an amazing song. Huh. So it, it's one of those albums where, where stylistically it's all over the place. But I think there's like this overall feeling of, like frazzledness to that record, mm-hmm. like it, it feels like one of those albums where like, like you were psychically burnt out when you're listening to to it. Like <laughs> I kind of felt like, like I felt many times like I was living that album in terms of just the the feel of it and kind of just the kind of feeling of exhaustion and being spread too thin. The album was like almost a like a sonic equivalent of that. Oh wow, that sounds really interesting. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick fire on a few things um, sure. just to kind of knock them out. Uh, be, just because I want to mention them, uh, because they were uh, amazing albums. Again, if if we had done a top twenty, which it, it seems like we kind of are, but um, <laughs> honorable mentions is basically the next ten essentially. Uh, but uh, I really liked the. I thought the Cowboy Junkies album that came out this year was really good. That was really solid. It was a good one. Um, I really liked the Stephen Malcolm's album that came out this year. Uh, and let's start quickly interrupt. Do you know he and uh, David Berman doing something new? Malcolmus and Burn. Apparently, for the the rumor mill is that they're they're they're, they're releasing a new project next year. No kidding. And apparently, yeah. Apparently, they've, they've been like Burn's doing a new band, and I think uh, Malcolmus and some other. I think Nastanovich and Malcolmus are in it. Wow, so, yeah, that's so awesome. I have something about to look that. for that. Yeah, um, the Breeders album I thought was oh, fantastic. Yeah. That just again that just mix, missed also. Um, and if you haven't heard of the Breeders, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> You ever seen them live? Uh, no, you know what? I didn't. I didn't go this year because of the location. I just am so anti. Is it Marquee? Marquee? Yeah. Oh man, fuck that! Uh, we talked about this before on the show. I, I've talked about it so many times. I can't even tell you. Well, but, I'll yeah. join you. I'll join. I'll throw my voice in the chorus. Fuck the Marquee. The Marquee is garbage. It's yeah. It's not. Yeah. The, the 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 security staff in particular has never been nice. They've always been rather rude, actually. And I just I, I don't know. The it's it's never been, I've seen I've seen some good shows there despite the venue, basically. And now that we've got the Crescent and the Van Buren and everything, I'm like, I forget it. I'll just I'll go there or, you know, maybe I'll go to Tucson to see them. But I, I would actually rather go to Tucson and see them at the Rialto then then go to oh, 100%. Yeah, then go to the marquee. Um uh the new Colexico, I thought was great. Uh I thought it was it was uh, their last couple of albums have been kind of snoozers for me. And then this one I felt like they had they'd been veering more towards a pop sound, I thought. Yeah. And then this one um they got I, I had been missing a lot of that spaghetti western element that I loved from their early stuff. And they, I, it felt like they, they brought, um, they found like a harmony between the two finally. And it was a really solid one. Um, LA Salami, that's kind of the closest <laughs> to, um, to <laughs> hip hop that I got this year. Um, but it's, he's, so I really liked the album that he put out last year. And, um, I was surprised that he came out with another one so quickly and was kind of prepared for it to be a sophomore slump thing. Yeah. But, um, but it wasn't, it was really, really solid. And it's called the city of, of bookmakers. Um, actually I think I typed that wrong. I think it's the city of bootmakers. Um, <laughs> which is very different. I think it's bootmakers. Uh, but he's this, this English guy is kind of like a uh, lyrically very political in a in a Billy Bragg sort of sense. All right, yeah. But he's um he is from he's an African immigrant and I feel terrible for not remembering where he's from, but he 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 migrated to uh to the UK and um he he's he's got this um uh very uh you know he's got this kind of british tinge to his 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 singing so it's it's kind of like if billy bragg were doing a hip hop style 
with you know also some like Bob Dylan wordplay, and it just there it's it's really fantastic. Um, I again I, I that's I, I recommend that really highly. There there that was one that I gave that one an eight point seven five. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was really close to getting the top. Um. There's I don't know how to pronounce this one. This one uh, is is a, a, a it's a, a, a female duo called Omi. I guess O H M M E. O H M. Um, and one of the singers. Um, I I don't know. Uh, I I could look at the liner notes, but um, individually I don't know the 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 women's names. But one of them I had seen um, play. She was in Tweety's band when okay, he was touring yeah. the album with his son um and and she was a, a singer on that tour and i really loved her voice so i started kind of checking out what she was doing then i saw um i saw this one uh on the racks at, at uh stinkweeds and gave it a shot and it's it's this really um they have great harmonies the, um and uh kind of uh just really excellent um non-traditional lyric structure uh in a very kind of ethereal pop sounding setting uh and it's it's just it's really really good stuff um it it ended up when i was going back through and i i had a lot of harmony albums in my in what I picked up this year, whether it was yeah. the Mill Carton Kids or First Aid Kit, which First Aid Kit's album was up there pretty high for a while. And then when I listened to this one again and was kind of like trying to shuffle these around, this one to me just blew it out of the water as far as, as you know, the you the kind of uniqueness. Because um, it, it, the, you know, a good harmony album I love, um, but it's uh you know when they start to sound like they're they're trying to stick too close to a traditional kind of sound um, yeah. then it can get boring after a while and this doesn't so uh if you if you are a fan of great harmonies and uh, but like your your unique kind of um you know, out there eclectic song structure that uh it's, the album is called parts very nice all right. Anything else you want to knock out before oh, we sure. get into the top? Yeah, some quick right, fire quick. stuff. Yeah. A couple of the uh, the the the, uh, the remaining honorable mentions. Um, this one's technically an EP, but I really, I, I avoid. I, to be fair, I, I avoided this record for a little while because all the hype about it. But I really love the Boy Genius EP. Oh, I, that's the one I still need. That's one of those ones that I still need to get. Oh, the first song, like the "Bite the Hand That Feeds," with like that's just the, the the quality of the guitar sound they have on that record is stunning. The lyrics are so wonderful, and like I really enjoyed the Lucy Dacus solo album. Like "Historian" was an mm. album that, uh, the, like, I, it's not in my top ten, but it's something. That, it's it's really a well constructed piece of work, and I've loved uh, Julian Baker's work for a long time. So hearing her, the, the two of them plus Phoebe Bridges doing like doing a, a work, an album together. Like I it made, me, it made me hungry for a larger work. Like, Hopefully that'll come. I I I um I got Julian Baker's album last year and I liked that a lot. Uh and Phoebe Bridger's album from last year was was up there up there for me as one of my one of my favorites as well. Um so yeah, I got to check that one out. Also uh, on the hip hop front, uh, there's this group from the UK Young Fathers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they put out a couple albums, but the, the newest one this year was Coco Sugar and it was it's really interesting because it reminded me a lot of, um, maybe it's a little cliche to say, but it reminded me a bit of Massive Attack. Oh, Where okay. that similar kind of like nocturnal, slow vibe to it where it's not like super aggressive music, but it, it's kind of like music kind of tiptoes and sneaks up on you. Gotcha. And they, they're just the, the production on that record is very inventive. And plus, they also do a lot of things in their voice that they play with it. Like they don't, they don't necessarily use like auto-tune or anything, mm-hmm. but like they'll, they'll, do, they'll do like cartoony voices or huh. they'll like... Put on these kind of personas in their songs. It was, just, it was just a really interesting. It's an interesting record to kind of lose yourself in for a little while. That's that sounds really good. And also, uh, Gouge Away, which are they're a hardcore band from Florida. 
Uh, they put out a couple. Um, they put out an album I think a year ago. It was pretty strong. But this one, it's interesting because a lot. It reminds me a lot of like '90s groups like the Jesus Lizard. Oh, or like or like Screaming Trees, like the kind of more heavier side, like the '90s underground, mm-hmm. where the the the, the, the vocalist, the front woman's a front, front person is a woman, so she screams like like a banshee from hell. Oh, nice. But the songs are like really short and punchy, and they kind of they kind of evoke what I love about like like the, the harder '90s songs, but still manages sound contemporary in the process. Rick, that sounds really good. It's, it is really, it's really great. I think we should probably, if um, if you uh, before you go, I'll take like uh, if you have a, a list written down, I'll take a picture of it or something, and I'll <laughs> sure, sure. if I can read it, uh, and scratchy. then I'll put it up on the, I'll put it up out uh, next week when I post the show. Yeah, definitely, dude. Um, yeah, anything else you wanted to hit up? Oh, uh, I guess the last thing. Let me see. Whoop. Oh, um, I guess on the jazz front, I've, I listened to I listened to very little new jazz this year. Okay, but there is one album I heard by uh, Micaiah Micaiah Micaiah. I think, I think it's Micaiah McCraven, Universal Beings, mm-hmm. and that album blew me away. Because when I was reading about it, it's like it, it was like four different live concerts he, that he did with him. Because uh, McCraven's a drummer. So he had four different ensembles. I heard about this one, yeah. and he cut all those different like takes mm-hmm. and concerts together. It's like one album. So it ha- so it's kind of like those old Miles Davis albums in the seventies where they would just record in the studio for hours and hours and hours, and afterwards they would just edit everything and together, to, together to one seamless track. So it's kind of like that, but they did with like all live recordings. So you get like crowd noise, and you do get that live energy in the room. But also, it's you know this really dense and nautically composed piece of music. That sounds really good. And there's also like a lot of these gambling kind of sounds too. So it, so it, it is kind of like this kind of swimming drum heavy jazz music. But there's also like a lot of these bells ringing and kind of this kind of kind of tinkling chiming kind of gambling aspect to it too. Oh, cool. So it's like it's like jazz you can bop to, but it's also kind of got like this like almost new agey quality to it because of all those extra sounds. That sounds uh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's it's really cool. It, it, it's it's long. It's a little repetitive at times because it it repeats itself quite a bit in terms of motifs. But it's it's definitely a rewarding album. Uh, the only other one left that I think I wanted to mention, uh, and I only feel like mentioning it because when I initially listened to it, I um, did not say super kind things about it. Um, <laughs> was the Neil, Neil and Liam Finn album that came out this year, uh, Light Sleeper. Initially, oh. um, it just it just felt too much like a sketch of something that could have been uh, better. Yeah. And then I was... Uh, but this happened a lot this year because so many of my favorite artists, bands, whatever, put out new music this year. and um, And I kept coming up against the... Well, it's just not not as good as i wanted it to be from them you know i don't know why i put i i put such a high expectation on 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 these people except for the fact that i've been listening to some of them for you know 15 20 years at this point i guess <laughs> yeah. um but uh when i listen to it again i'm like as far as something that if i look at it as though it might have been a concept album that this was kind of a collaboration between neil finn and his son liam and they played all the instruments pretty much except for some orchestration and like I think uh Neil's wife Sharon guests on on bass on a couple of spots, but it's otherwise pretty much just them doing everything. And um they uh they it it seems like they put it together um as kind of a nocturnal exercise. And there's a lot of very like ethereal sort of sound to it and if i put it in that context it's actually a really interesting exercise to kind of delve into and they're still such just i mean these guys can write neil finn especially can write a pop classic in his sleep you know so um <laughs> it's just I, I i i feel like his last several albums while i've learned you know while i've, I've had uh, like a growing appreciation for them i'm really just hankering for him to throw down another like hooky pop album like uh like try whistling this or some of you know even some of the the crowded house sort of sound where it was just yeah. like you know this is something that i'm i'm really going to be able to like uh nod my head to like a uh a, 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 you know a white person so <laughs> <laughs> um hmm. so there was that i i that moved way back it moved way up the list from where I thought it was going to end up. 
Do you think it's one of those things where maybe because it would come so easy to him to write a song, an album like that, maybe that's mm-hmm. why he doesn't want to do it? Very, very probably. I mean, he did something really cool last year. First of all, he's somebody who who used to take many, many years between albums, right? And, you know, and he's somebody who's got like four different projects going on because he can do... <laughs> He can do a Finn Brothers record, he can do a Credit House record, he can do a solo, he can do whatever, he's got other stuff going on. And it's 